السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. إن فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ان شاء الله تعالى today the secret topic I told the organizers it was secret because I was still thinking about it um, but the topic is actually something I've been thinking about for the last couple of months. And I feel that uh, in the Ummah, there are lots of different kinds of confusion. And we see the world around us and we think about the realities around us, whether they are political realities or social realities or economic realities, or they are realities in regards to our own life. and we you know, we have to figure out what it all means. We have to make sense of things like the news or we have to make sense of, you know, the own, our own challenges in our lives. But I feel more and more that we actually don't look at reality around us through the Book of Allah. In other words, the best way to understand reality is to understand certain concepts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you understand those concepts, your view and your perspective and your opinion changes. Now I want to give you an example before I begin the specific conversation. And that is that, you know, imagine that you are wearing glasses or you have really weak eyesight. You have really weak eyesight. And you're not wearing your glasses. Okay? So you, you can see, but you can't see accurately. Right? There's something missing in what you can see. You may see that there's a sign, but you, not, you may not be able to read it exactly. You understand what I'm saying? But once you put the right lenses on, you put the right glasses on, then now you can see things clearly. I want you to think of the Qur'an, and especially the Book of Allah, the Qur'an, as a kind of glasses. Once you put them on, once you start thinking through the Qur'an, reality becomes clear. Like you start seeing things in a different light. That you did not see them in the same way before. Okay? I'll give you a small example of that before I actually talk about the ayat that I really want to talk to you about. And this is actually, in my opinion, it is probably going to take me about six months to a year, if not more, to study this one surah before I can comprehensively talk about the surah. But right now I'll just share with you some brief concepts. But before I do, just an example. If I was going with a bunch of young men and women on a bus and we drove by a beautiful mansion, it's so just a gorgeous house on top of a hill. On the other side, there's the ocean. Just an absolutely beautiful, stunning house. And the, the driveway into the house, there's a gorgeous car parked outside. And on the back of the house, there's this incredible backyard and a swimming pool and all of it. I mean, whatever you can imagine is there. It's like it's a piece of Jannah on earth. And you see the guy walking into his house. We're driving on this bus and we see this guy walking into his house. And I ask these young men and women, do you think that guy's successful? Do you think he's successful? Overwhelmingly, what is going to be the response? Yeah, that's pretty successful. And the guy, look at him. Look at what he's accomplished in life. That's a pretty successful person. Okay. When you take a picture of someone graduating from college, they're shaking hands with the president of the university, they're being handed their diploma, and somebody asks you, do you think that's successful? What are people going to say? You know, it's going to be Muslims and non-Muslims. Everybody's going to say that that is a kind of what? Success. We are going to, I'm going to congratulate my children one day when they graduate from college too, because that's a kind of success. When somebody gets a job, is that a kind of success? Sure. 
We congratulate people when they get a job. When somebody buys a house, when somebody starts a business, when somebody gets a new car, when somebody gets married, when people accomplish things in life, then we, we celebrate them because these are different kinds of small and big successes. Isn't that true? So the bus keeps driving. And we see a, a man, a homeless man, who's living in a cardboard box on the street. And he looks like he's wearing clothes from a couple of years. And you don't want to go close to him because of the smell. And I ask my students, do you think that guy's successful? What do they say? I say, he's not successful. Now imagine if I was riding in this bus, but in this bus there were not Muslim boys and girls, but there were Christian boys and girls, or Jewish boys and girls, or atheist boys and girls, or agnost boys and girls, or Buddhist boys and girls. And I asked them the same exact question. Do you think their answers would be the same? Yep, their answers would be the same. That's the problem. The problem is the way we think about success, and the way we think about failure, for Muslims, it's supposed to be different. All human beings can see it a certain way, that's fine. They have the apparent view of success and failure. But us Muslims, Allah has given us clearer glasses. And once you look at reality through these glasses, you see something other people cannot see. You see something other people cannot see. So when you put those glasses on, then you start thinking about the Book of Allah and you realize that one of the most beautiful, captivating, magnificent homes that was ever built was the castle of Fir'aun. It was one of the most amazing homes ever built. And if our bus was driving by the castle of Fir'aun and he was walking into his house and I asked my Muslim children, is that successful? Is that guy successful? What would their answer be? Fir'aun is not successful. He's the one of the worst losers in all of human history. Isn't that the case? What was the second kind of person we, met, we ran into? There was one guy walking into a mansion. What was the other guy? It was a homeless guy. Okay. Ibrahim salam was kicked out of his house. He was told to leave the house. So he's homeless. Well, was he successful? He was. Actually, he's one of the most successful human beings that ever lived. Now the Qur'an is teaching me that a homeless man is successful. And an incredibly wealthy man is what? A failure. You know what that, the Qur'an is teaching me? The Qur'an is teaching me that success has nothing to do with wealth. And, nothing, and failure has nothing to do with poverty. Success and failure are different concepts for us than they are for everybody else. Some of you want your children to get a good education. I want you to think about this. The parents here. You want your children to get a good education. Why do you want your children to get a good education? Because you want them to be successful. Isn't that the case? You want them to get a job. You want them to get a good career. You want them to have a good life. You don't want them to rent an apartment. You want them to buy a house. You want them to go into a good paying profession. You want them to become a lawyer or a doctor. You want them to become an engineer. You know? This is what you want for your kids. You want them to have a good life. Now tell me. Sometimes we send our children to school and we send them to a different country or we send them to a different state or a different city. And even before our children left our home to go to these schools, you already notice that they are starting to disobey you. They're becoming disobedient to you. They're becoming less and less and less regard, mindful of their prayer. And you're thinking in the back of your head, maybe, maybe if they go to college in a different city, that things are going to get worse. They're going to become even more rebellious, even more independent, even more careless. But then you think to yourself, but if they don't go to college in a different city, they're not going to succeed. They're not going to succeed. So you know what most parents do? What decision they make? Let them go. Let them go. Then four years go by, and then I get the email. I get the email, my child doesn't talk to me. My child wants nothing to do with me. My child has run off and married a non-Muslim. My child tells me that he doesn't believe in Islam anymore, or whatever, whatever, whatever. That didn't happen overnight. That, there, that process began a long time ago. 
But you know what? Even the, Muslim, the concerned Muslim parent, maybe they didn't think about success and failure for themselves and for their child clearly enough to make the right kinds of decisions. Because in their head, so long as they graduate from college, they must be what? Successful. The price was too high. The price was not just the tuition. Now, that's not the only, you didn't just pay tuition. You paid the price of guidance in some cases. That's a too high a price to pay. There's a lot of serious things for us to think about as families when we make our decisions. So this was just an example to give you, you know, just about the concept of success and failure. How are the way we look at it from the lens of Iman, from the lens of the Quran, then our view changes. We, we can't th think of it the same way as everybody else anymore. Now I want to come to you to the example that I, 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 I've been thinking about for a while. And like I told you, six months to a year I still need before I really completely formulate my thoughts and my research on it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after, so I'll give you a brief history, okay? So the, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we, we, we won the battle of Badr under his leadership. Then we had some serious losses in the, in the incident at Uhud. There were two battles now between us and the Mushrikun of Mecca. The Muslims are in Medina, they're in Mecca. Be, we've, been, we've clashed militarily two major times. The third time the Quraysh say, we don't want this 50% chance we win, 50% chance we lose. We want a 100% guarantee of winning. So what we're going to do is we're going to gather all of the tribes of Arabia and make sure we have all of their support, as many of them as we can get. We're going to go to each of them and say, listen, the Muslims are our enemy. But I tell you, if they become powerful, they will come after you. So if you want to stay the way things are, you should join us. Let's end this problem because right now this is our problem. But if you don't help us and be, don't become the United Nations of Arabia, United Tribes of Arabia, this is going to become all of our problem. We have to eliminate the Islamic threat. We have to do that. So then they, they went to all the tribes and they said, you need to unite with us and we all go together. And instead of waiting for a battlefield, we'll all march to Medina. And our army is going to be so big because it's going to be made up of all the tribes that we're going to walk into Medina and we will kill every man, woman and child of the Muslims. We'll get rid of all of them. We'll just finish the story. End the problem. Because it's becoming a serious problem. So a lot of tribes who used to be neutral, they did not hate Islam. They, did, they were not enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. But when they were given the story that this is a matter of national security, they became convinced and they said, fine, if it's a matter of protecting the way of our life and the way things are, we'll come with you. So now a huge legion, which is why it's called Al-Ahzab, different groups, huge legion of armies are coming, heading towards Medina. On the other hand, the Jews of Medina, who had made a peace treaty with the Muslims of Medina, made a secret treaty with you know, the Yemeni tribes and some of the Christian tribes in the back of the Muslims and said, listen, if the Muslims get attacked and we're, we don't, have, don't have, have enough forces, you guys can attack from the other side. You can take us out from the, they can, you can take them out from the other side. So from this side, the Quraysh will come and get them. From this side, you can come and get them. They're gonna be done. We'll help you from the inside. Now the Muslims have three enemies. One enemy coming from above, one enemy coming from below, and one enemy that is where? Inside. This is going to be over. This is it. Allah Azza wa Jal decided that He is going to... He, he describes this entire scenario in Surah Al-Ahzab. Okay, Surah number 33 is where this entire scene is painted. إِذْ جَاءُكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ بْتُلِّيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا It's incredible ayat. When the armies were coming from above you and from below you and when your eyes were wide open like this, you couldn't even blink your eyes, you were that scared and your hearts were reaching into your throats and you were thinking all kinds of thought. Then and there the Muslims were tested and the earth beneath their feet was shaken. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا Oh, they were shaken alright. They were intensely shaken. Oof. 
That is the scene of the Battle of Ahzab. And then we know that the advice of Salman al-Farisi was to dig a hole, dig a trench all around the city so that their horses and their cavalry can't enter into the city. They'll fall into the ditch but they won't be able to come up. And that is the only thing keeping the entire city alive. That is the only thing. Now we're in this crazy situation, Allah Azza wa Jal protected the Muslims anyway. And they are waiting outside because you know the, the city does not have all of the food supplies and all of the rations inside. Eventually they're going to run out of food. Eventually they're going to run out of supplies. So they will have to surrender. Eventually. So the armies decided that we'll just wait outside the trench. Fine. We won't fight. We won't come into the trench. We'll just wait outside. After five, six weeks, the people inside will die anyway of starvation. Or they'll come out and surrender. So Allah Azza wa Jal you know, sent you know, we sent winds against them. Now imagine the army's camp. Guys, I want you to imagine this picture. They are soldiers, they've got a... Whoa, where did that come from? Allah sent winds and somebody sent a balloon. Well, anyway, okay, so... Um, so, you've got these tents. Army soldiers have tents. And how do they cook? They make a barbecue outside with a fire, right? They don't have microwaves back in the day. So they have, they have to make a fire. And they're cooking their food or whatever. And a wind comes. And the pot tips over. And it sets fire to the tent. And when it sets fire to the tent, the horses go crazy and they run away. And the, wind, the fire spreads and three or four or five tents are on fire now. In other words, these winds kept coming and causing so many problems for the army on the outside that eventually they said, we can't stay here anymore. They left. They left. So instead of waiting for the Muslims to, to come out, they couldn't handle it on the outside. Allah defended the Muslims by the wind. By the wind. And they left. They failed. They failed in their attack. Six months later, I'm, I'm fast forwarding history for you. Study, study the seerah exhaustively because these are important events in the life of the Prophet But I'm giving you, I just want to get to these ayat. So I'm giving you the fast forward version. Six months go by. And after six months, the Prophet ﷺ says, I have seen a dream. And in my dream, according to my, and by the way, the dream of a Prophet is wahi, is revelation. So what he sees, we have to do it. I have seen a dream that we are going to enter the Kaaba. And we are going to enter the Kaaba peacefully. We're not even going to have to fight. And we're going to go there and make Hajj. Now when you go to Hajj, can you take your shotgun with you? Can you take your sword with you? Can you take your spear with you? Can you take your bow and arrow with you? No. No. You don't take weapons to Hajj. Okay, you don't take weapons to Hajj. And the, the dream says that you will go, and will you go for war or you will go peacefully? You're gonna go peacefully. And where are you gonna go? Let me ask you again, so, so I know you're still awake. Where are you going to go? You're gonna go to Mecca. Where did the Quraysh come from? Mecca. Where did they come? To Medina. Why did they come to Medina? To kill all the Muslims. And now the Prophet sees a dream, six months later, we should go to Mecca. And we should go without any weapons. To make Hajj. And nothing's gonna happen because I've seen a dream. And the Muslims believe him. Let's go. If you've seen a dream, let's go. If you ask anybody else, to follow into the city that was just thirsty for your blood. You want to go there and make hajj? Are you sure? Are you sure that was your dream? No, no, no. Let's just go. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ He said the truth. Let's follow him. So they go. Now, when you go to hajj or you go to umrah from here, how long is the flight? Hmm? I don't know, tell me. 14 hours? Allahu Akbar, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. 14 hours. I'm sure their trip from Medina to Mecca must not have been 14 hours, it must have been less. Oh wait, they were walking. They're walking from Medina to what? Mecca. So it's gonna take a few weeks, maybe even months before they get there. They're not like you, who go to the airport, then wait in the lounge for two hours, then go on the plane, which is air-conditioned, with a TV screen in front of you, which helps you prepare for Hajj. Okay? 
And there you're sitting on the couch, like, ah, oh, this is so uncomfortable, my back, e <laughs> You know? 14 hours, there's a one hour delay, stop, oh. These guys are walking. Is there air conditioning? Is there any lounge, like a club lounge where you can get a snack? No? Is there anybody walking over and offering them headphones or a wet towel or? Uh-uh. Is there snacks offered every few hours or? Uh-uh. And the closer they get, the closer they are getting to their own death. I mean, if you think about it, they're get, who wants to kill them? The Makkans. And you're going into their city, you're going into the lion's den itself, <laughs> without weapons, you're going to get killed. So they're walking with Rasul Sallallahu They're going to Makkah. They get close enough. And the, there's, a, there's an interesting story. You have to understand different sides of the story. Again, because I have to fast forward this for you, I have to skip parts. But the Quraysh found out that the Muslims are coming. So they... What is, it, what, is there a fight back there? What happened? Uh, it's okay. No, it's not that interesting. If something interesting happens, I'll tell you. Okay. So what was I saying? Something about Islam? What was I saying? Remind me. Uh, the Quraysh. The Quraysh found out that the Muslims are coming. And they also found out that the Muslims are coming unarmed. They're not armed. They're coming unarmed. So they said, if they get too close, there's going to be a problem. Let's try to kill them before they get e any close. So they sent Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu because he had a fast battalion. His, him and his men were fast. They were quick horsemen. To go and catch the Muslims quickly, maybe even around the area of Badr, quickly catch them and kill them. Kill all of them before they get close to Makkah. I'll tell you why they didn't want the Muslims to get close to Makkah. I'll tell you later. But you know, Rasul sallallahu found out because he had sent some scouts, he found out that Khalid is coming this way. So the Muslims went the other way. And they ended up in the place called Hudaybiyah. They ended up in Hudaybiyah. Now the thing is, let me tell you why the Quraysh didn't want them to get close. The Quraysh, what did they have all around the Kaaba? Do you know? What did they have all around the Kaaba? Idols. And these, each of these idols is from a different tribe. Okay, so each, they're not all tri or idols for the Quraysh. Some idols are for the people of Ta'if, some idols for the people of somewhere else, you know, the, the Hudalis or whoever else, right? Different tribes, all of their idols are sitting in Makkah. And why does everybody respect Makkah? Why does everybody respect the Quraysh? Because they hold the idols. And also because they take care of people who come and give and do the tawaf and do the hajj. And why do they have respect? Because if somebody comes unarmed to Makkah to do hajj, even if it's a hajj of shirk, even if they come for that, then the Makkans will take care of them or attack them. They'll take care of them. And that is the only reason all of Arabia respects Makkah. So if the Muslims are coming for Hajj and they are unarmed and the Quraysh attack them, then they will lose the respect of all of the Arabs. And all of the Arabs are already angry with Makkah because Makkah told them, Quraysh told them to leave their homes and come out and kill all the Muslims. But did they get to kill the Muslims? No. And is it cheap to gather an army or expensive? It's very expensive. So all the tribes spent a lot of money to come and try to attack the Muslims, but that failed. And now they've all gone back. And are they, are they ready to listen to Makkah again, to Quraysh again? No, like you wasted our time and money. We went out there for nothing. We're not listening to you people again. And now the Muslims are coming. And if you try to kill the Muslims when they're making Hajj, it's not like the rest of the tribes like Makkah right now. So the Quraysh are like, if we attack the Muslims after they have reached the Miqat and after they've reached, reached Hudaybiyah, then all the Arabs are going to say, forget these Meccans, man. They cost us all this money. And now they're killing Hujaj. Forget these people. Let's kill them. So now the Quraysh cannot kill the Muslims. They're stuck. They're stuck. But the Muslims don't know that. The Muslims are just going and they think the Mus that the Quraysh might still what? Kill them. They stop at Hudaybiyah. Rasulullah sends somebody inside. He sent Uthman anhu inside as an ambassador. We're coming to make Hajj. We're not going to fight. We're just coming to make Hajj, which is pretty amazing. You guys just tried to kill us and now we're going to walk into your house. So would you? you know. What's up? And we're going to go around your house and we're going to walk back. You know what that is? That is spitting on the enemy's face and saying, what you going to do? Huh? 
What are you going to do? So the Quraysh, they don't know what to do, but they arrest Uthman. They're, they're panicking. They don't know what to do. What, what, this guy, what is he doing here? What do you mean they have an ambassador? What do you mean they're in Hudaybiyah? Capture him. Ar detain him. Arrest him. And they arrest him and the rumor spreads that they killed him. The rumor spread that the, the Quraysh have killed who? Uthman radiallahu anhu. Where is the Prophet ﷺ and all of the Muslims? Where are they? You tell me now. They're in Hudaybiyah. So these Muslims are in Hudaybiyah and they get the news, they get the rumor that Uthman has been killed. But the truth of it is Uthman has not been killed, he has only been what? Arrested. Arrested. But when the Prophet hears that Uthman has been killed, radiallahu anhu, he gets very upset. And he gathers all of the Muslims and he asks them to take an oath of allegiance under a tree. He calls them and says, you have to pledge to me that we will take revenge for the murder of Uthman. We're going to go into Mecca and we're going to take revenge for what they did to Uthman. Now he's going to take this oath from the people who came for war or came for Hajj. So do they have weapons or no? No, they only have the, the knife, the small knife that they use to slaughter the animal. That's all they got. They have no shields, they have no bow and arrow, they have no spears, and they're going to go inside the most heavily armed weapons depot city in all of Arabia, and that is Mecca. They're going to go inside Mecca to take revenge for Uthman. And, and Rasulullah says, I need you to pledge to me that you will be loyal to me and you're going to go. Because we have to seek revenge for Uthman. Do the Muslims agree? They agree. All the Muslims who agree, are they also now, they also know, what are the chances? Are we going to win or are we going to get killed? So we're ready to be killed. We're ready to die. Now, I want you to understand something. Actually, no, not yet. I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Now the Muslims are ready to go kill. And when the, when the Quraysh find out the Muslims are ready to go into war, they say, no, 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 we didn't kill Uthman, we just arrested him, you can have him back. Take him back, take him back. Calm down. Now the Muslims were already ready to fight, but then they what? They calm down. Then they said, okay, let us come make Hajj. No, 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 you can't make Hajj. You can't make Hajj. Let's make a treaty. This is called the treaty of what? Hudaybiyah, Sulh Hudaybiyah. Let's make a treaty. And if you know anything about this treaty, you know that all of the, the terms in this treaty go against the Muslims. Every one of them goes against the Muslims and every one of them is in the favor of the Quraysh. So they, they give this treaty to the Prophet ﷺ. This is the treaty. What do you say? And the Prophet ﷺ signs it or doesn't sign it? He signs it. He signs it. And that means that you will not make Hajj this year, you can come back next year. You don't make Hajj this year, you can come back next year. Now let me tell you something. If you paid for your Hajj package, and you flew to Medina, and when you got to the airport in Medina, after a 14 hour flight and a couple of halal McDonald's, when you got to the passport office, the guy looks at you and says, uh, come back next year. What are you going to do? What are you talking about, mate? <laughs> you can't do that to me. I came for Hajj. What do you mean go back? Yes, go back. And go back peacefully. Like, what? You can't do this to me. I flew all this way 14 hours. I paid for my ticket. I, I got the visa. I got the approval. I have the Hajj package. No, go back. Where did these people come from? They came from Medina. Muslims came from Medina. Did they fly over to Mecca? Did they walk over to Mecca? They walked over to Mecca. Are they hoping to make Hajj? Yes. And when they finally get there, Rasulullah says, he signs the paper and says what? Okay everyone, let's walk back to Medina. Now I want you to understand human beings have emotions. Human beings, we're all human beings. Sahaba are human beings too. Human beings have emotions. And it is very hard sometimes to control our emotions. And sometimes when our emotions get out of control, we become chaotic. We become chaotic. You know when a, a large group of people be become very angry, there can be a riot. Isn't that true? 
Because, because of their emotions, there can be chaos. Isn't, that, what, isn't that what happens? Is everything okay? Did I do something? No? Okay. Alright, you were trying to do some kind of sneak attack, but I, I caught you. Now you have to reset the game and start over again. It's like a video game. I gotta... Ah! You know, from last checkpoint. Anyway! What was I talking about? Islam or something? What was I talking about? Emotions. Now let's go back to this story a little bit. I, I haven't made my point yet. I'm just telling you a story right now. I haven't made my point yet. I'm gonna make my point soon. Very soon. Be very patient. Okay. Rasulullah six months ago, along with all of the Muslims, almost got killed. Yes? Which emotion was there when we were almost killed? Fear. Extreme fear. Yes? Okay. Every man, woman, and child. That fear is described in Surah Al Ahzab. We were in a state of fear. Okay. Six months later, the Prophet says, I have seen a dream. We're going to go where? Mecca. Now there's concern. Really? Are we going to go to Mecca? Maybe even doubt. But no, he said it. We should go. We should go. And now there may even be more fear. Because that time the murderers came to us. Now we are going to the murderers. <laughs> the killers came to us. Now we're going to the killers. So there may even be even more fear. Then they finally make it to Hudaybiyah. When they get to Hudaybiyah, there is hope. Because now we cannot be attacked, so there is hope that we will do what? We'll do Hajj. By the way, is going to Hajj cheap? You have to spend a lot of time, and you have to spend a lot of money. You have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money. It's not cheap even for the Sahaba to go to Hajj. It's not cheap. So now they are full of hope. Then the news comes that Uthman anhu has been killed and the Muslims are full of what? Anger. Then they take an oath that we will take revenge and they are full of courage and excitement. You know when you, before the war begins, before the general says, Attack! <laughs> but before he does that, what are the soldiers doing? You know like the guy in the boxing match before the, before ding 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 or before a UFC fight, okay don't pull each other's ears, don't bite each other Go! But before he does go, what are people doing? What are the two guys doing? You know? You're filled with aggressiveness, right? Is that a calm emotion or an intense emotion? That's a very intense emotion. So we're talking about intense fear, intense hope, intense aggression, intense anger. These people have gone through a lot of intense emotions. You with me so far? Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa signs a treaty and they feel like this treaty is intensely insulting. What? We don't get to make Hajj? What? If one of us runs away from Mecca, we have to send him back to Mecca? What? We, we have to go back? We can't fight them? We were ready to just take revenge right now. Ugh! And now we have to just go back home? Disappointment. Frustration. There are so many emotions in these people. And it's not one person. It is lots of people. Now let me tell you something. If you have one young man, one young man who is very angry, extremely angry, is it easy to calm him down? No. Calm down, calm down, son, calm down. Just relax, relax, relax. Okay, okay, just relax, relax. Just, just. It might take you 30 minutes before this young guy whose nostrils are, you know, they're, they're filling, swelling up like... <laughs> it might take a while before he calms down, you understand? That is just one angry man. Are there, there are they in the thousands? If there are hundreds, if not thousands of angry men, is it easy to calm them down? No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns to them and he says, we're not going this year, let's go back. He said, I thought you saw a dream. We're going to make Hajj. And Rasul sallallahu said, I never said this year. <laughs> what do you mean you never said this year? If it wasn't this year, why did we come here? But they didn't say anything. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, everybody take your ihram off. Because once you put the ihram on, you have made the intention for Hajj. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, everybody take your ihram off. They don't take it off. 
They don't take it off. Why not? You tell me now, why not? One angry man's emotions are hard to control. A huge mob of angry men is impossible. It is impossible. If all of you were angry at me, and I said, calm down, calm down, I would be dead. <laughs> it's over. I cannot. You're going to kill me. You understand that? You cannot control a mob. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. You know, when there's chaos in a, like, you know, sometimes you see on the news, there's a gr group of people, and somebody fires a gun in the air. And the whole crowd, what happens to it? They all, everybody goes in different directions and they're running over each other and there's chaos. And if somebody's saying, everybody stop! Do they stop? No. You can't control them anymore. Their, their emotions are too high. Now Rasulullah comes back into his tent and he's shocked because this is the first time he has not heard Sami'na wa ata'na. This is the first time. First time. First time. And his, the, the mother of the believer sees him. And she says, don't worry, you just take yours off, they will calm down. So he takes his off. And then when he goes, and you shave your head, and she, he goes outside, and what do they start doing? They're angry, they're upset, they're, I can't believe we're not going to, we're going to walk all the way back now? Why do we come all this? No, okay, fine. We'll just take it all off. We'll, we'll take the ihram off, we're going back home. Now, this was a pretty important incident. So Allah decided to describe this incident. This, I'm all, now I'm at my point. This is a, I, I, I painted a historical event for you so far. What happened in history? Now I want you to see how Allah describes this event. Not how I describe this event. Not how you describe this event. Not how the Sahaba thought about this event. Not even how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam sees this event, but how Allah sees this event. The ayah comes down to describe this entire story, and the ayah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. No doubt about it. We have, we in fact, we have granted to you an obvious, unconditional open, clear victory. You have been given a, sp a special favor of the most awesome victory of all time. That is the Quran's description of what happened. This is actually the ultimate victory. What? This is the ultimate victory? If you ask a Muslim child, what, is the, what, what was the day of victory in Islam? In the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, what is the day of victory? What are they going to say? When Makkah was conquered. Yes? When Makkah was conquered was the day of victory. Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina did not come down when Makkah was conquered. Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina came down when we didn't get to go to Hajj. When we signed a treaty that was against us. When we were completely disappointed. Where is the victory? I don't see it. CNN won't see it. The historian won't see it. Even Sahaba don't see it. The Sahaba don't see it. How can you call this victory? Oh, by the way, Allah did not say, Inna fatahna lahum fathan mubina. Inna fatahna laka. Laka, ya Rasulullah, laka, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fathan mubina. I want you to understand this. According to Allah, According to Allah, the greatest victory of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because this is not a victory for the Muslims, this is not a victory for Islam. In the ayah, this is a victory for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The greatest victory in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are the Sahaba who even when they have the most intense emotions, they still obeyed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the ultimate victory. This mob who was able to control their emotions because their emotions are very high but their loyalty to Allah's Messenger is even higher and out of that loyalty they can maintain their discipline. There is never ever going to be a greater victory than this. Ever. It's not Hudaybiyah. It's the Sahaba. That's the Sahaba.
People miss this point. Why am I telling you this? Because nowadays we make dua for victory. We make dua for victory, yes or no? We see the Muslims in the difficult situations around the Ummah and we make dua that Allah gives them and gives us victory. If we don't understand what victory means from the Qur'an, then maybe we don't understand what we're asking for. The victory of conquering a land, the victory of removing the kuffar, the victory of seizing territory. You know what Allah calls that? Wa ukhra. Lam taqdiru alayha qad ahat Allahu biha. Oh, it's secondary. <laughs> Allah calls the conquest of land secondary. Allah calls the conquest of the hearts of the believers primary. That's not my description. That is not a historian's description. Look, anybody else who would read the story of Hudaybiyah, they would think of it as a loss. But Allah will describe it as a victory. He'll describe it as a victory. The one thing I want you to think about here, and inshallah I'll give you the secondary benefit too before I close, but just this first ayah, just this, I mean, the, the, if I talked about the second ayah, we'd be here till Fajr and I got a flight to catch, so we can't do that. But the, 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 uh, just this first, I want to share something with you. You know, there's a secondary benefit of inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Let me explain. The treaty says that you are not going to fight with us and we are not going to fight with you. But if a Muslim runs away from Makkah, what will we do? Send him back. We'll send him back. And among other disadvantages to the Muslims. Okay. Let me not tell you about the Sira for a second. Let me tell you about international politics. Major governments in the world say we do not negotiate with terrorists. You ever heard this before? Governments say we do not negotiate with terrorists. If you negotiate with them, that means you have accepted that they are legitimate. Yes or no? Because you signed a paper with them, you shook a hand with them, you did a press release with them, you did a treaty with them, which means you think of them as a legitimate government. So if we sign a treaty with them, that is proof that they are legitimate in our eyes. Okay? And if a government thinks that the group, their enemy is small and they can crush them, they say, we don't need to make a treaty with these people, we can crush them. They're criminal, they're nothing. But if a group becomes powerful, so powerful that you can't just crush them, then you become weak and you have to accept that we have to sign a what? A treaty. The political victory in this ayah is that for the first time, the Quraysh, who up until now, what did they consider the Muslims? They considered the Muslims a cult. They considered the Muslims traitors. You can call them a terrorist group. Back then's language. But now they are signing a treaty with the Muslims. Which means the Quraysh have accepted the might and the muscle and the power of the Muslims. And Allah made them accept the power of the Muslims even when the Muslims didn't have weapons in their hands. They did not accept the might of the Muslims in Ahzab. They did not accept the might of the Muslims in Badr. Not in Uhud, not in Ahzab. But they accepted the power of the Muslims when Muslims came in Ihram. <laughs> I need you to understand that. Power is not about weapons. Power is not about weapons. In this ayah, we, the way we think of when will the kafir understand the power of the Muslim? When will they recognize the power of the Muslim? We have an emotional thought about that. But the seerah and the, the Quran have such a deeper understanding of this issue. They have such a powerful, it's a, such a powerful reality that the, the Quraysh had to sign this treaty. Now all of Arabia, the rest of the tribes, they don't like Quraysh. You remember why they don't like Quraysh? Because they made them go all the way to Ahzab. Now, all of Quraysh, all of the tribes see, yo, the Quraysh, they were gonna kill the Muslims six months ago, and now they are ready to sign a treaty. These Muslims are powerful, man. Yeah, these Muslims are serious. They're even more powerful than who? Than Quraysh. Because the Quraysh were forced to sign a treaty even when the Muslims were not with any weapons. That's crazy, man. That's some crazy tribal politics. 
And in this time, we have 10 years of peace. 10 years of no fighting. 10 years of no fighting. Guess what? I want you to, have you ever seen the map during election season? They say this party's, this party's colored blue, the other party's colored red. Right, so the blue is this big and the red is that big. Right? Now think of it like this. I'll say that, we'll give the Quraysh purple. Purple was huge. And the Muslims white was very little. It was very little. But especially during Ahzab, during the trench wars, all the tribes were against who? The Muslims. So the purple map was huge and the white map was very small. Now this little tiny white map goes over to the Quraysh and they make them sign a treaty. Now the white, white has become a little bit bigger. And the rest of the huge purple map has become neutral. Why did they become neutral? Because they don't like Quraysh anymore. So what do the Muslims do during the peace time? The Muslims go to every one of those tribes and say, hey, you want to stay neutral? Fine. But if you want to side with us, you could side with us too. Because we're big. We got muscle. Look at what we made the Quraysh do. And so some tribes say, no, you guys are, I, I'm scared of both of you guys. I, I don't want nothing. I, I want to be Switzerland. Okay. And some other tribes say, you know what? Sign me up. And guess what happens in these, these supposed to be 10 years, it doesn't take 10 years, but in months, the, perp, the map of the, of the region, the white starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's getting smaller? The purple is getting smaller. Poor guys are getting squeezed. And they're so, so squeezed and they're scared. Because one of the items in the treaty is, if we fight or you fight, if any fighting happens, then the whole thing is cancelled. Then the whole thing is cancelled. So, the Quraysh ended up fighting. By accident. They didn't mean to do it. They just ended up in a fight and some Muslims got killed. Oh no. If the treaty is gone, then what will the Muslims do? Take over. And now that the white is huge and the purple is tiny, they have, not, they have no power left. So Abu Sufyan, who's not a Muslim, who's one of the great leaders of Quraysh, has to now come to Medina. He has to come to Medina. Imagine they used to consider them insects. They considered them nothing. Now they have to come to Medina and he has to go find, make a meeting with Rasulullah So he goes to the house of Rasulullah And by the way, his daughter is married to Rasulullah So he goes into the house, he sees his daughter, he goes inside, he's about to sit down. She says, Dad, wait a second. And she rolls up the mat. Now you can sit on the floor. And he says, excuse me? Am I too good for this mat? Or is this mat too good for me? She says, well actually that's the Rasulullah's mat, it's too good for you. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> now he's already been told, well what is he going to negotiate now? His own, his own daughter just kind of put him in his place. You know, and this is, you don't treat an ambassador like that. Imagine an ambassador comes to your government, it comes to the you know, parliament house and they say, you're about to sit on a chair? They move the chair. Please sit on the floor. <laughs> That's insult, isn't it? That means this ambassador has no respect with us. You, you are nothing to us now. You used to think we are nothing. Now we think you are nothing. So he has no room to negotiate. He's begging and pleading, please don't attack us. Please, sorry, we made a mistake. I know the treaty is canceled, but can you please renew the treaty? Please, 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 please. And the Muslims say what? Um, no. Uh -uh. And we go and we make Hajj and we make it peacefully. We don't take weapons. We just go make Hajj and we conquer Makkah without a single weapon. We just conquer Makkah. But all of that happened the day the Muslims were frustrated and they couldn't fight and their anger was high and they said, come on, let's get the revenge for Uthman. And they said, come on, let's just make Hajj. Come on, we're right there with the enemy. Allah is with us. Let's just go fight them. Why are we accepting these, these insulting negotiations against the kuffar? We should take the kuffar on. Allah is with us. The angels are with us. Let's do this right now. That is the time where Allah would calm them down and they would listen to Rasulullah and they would learn to back off 
Because just within that year, you won't have to pick up any arms. You're just going to walk right in. And that all of that began with the first domino that fell was Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And Allah sums all of that up with one ayah, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have given you clearly, for you we have given a special kind of victory. We have given a special kind of victory. Wallahi, I tell you something. In Arabic, Inna fatahna fathan mubinan laka is expected. The jar majroor is supposed to be at the end, the grammar. When you make it muqaddam, it actually becomes muqtas. Which means, especially for you, we have given a clear victory. You know what that means? I, I, this is the last few comments I have for you. These are just, again, this is not the full lecture on this subject. These are just the thoughts I have thus far. Inshallah ta'ala, make dua I'm able to complete this study and do something comprehensive because personally I believe Muslims need to understand Surah Al-Fath very very clearly because this is the Surah of victory and I personally believe there's a lot of confusion among us what victory means. Is Salah time already or? Hana waqtu salam? Nadina waqtu? Okay. Okay. So one last thing about Inna Fatahna Laka Fatha Mubina. How do countries win in wars? By bombing, by killing, by war, by, by overpowering the forces, by sending tanks into the city. Isn't that how they win wars? And even when they take over, if a military takes over a country, does that necessarily mean that the people that live inside that country have given up? Has it happened in the world today that there's a military from another country, it takes over, it's, it's invaded, but the people have not accepted it? Does that happen? So you cannot call that a clear victory. It's a military victory, but it's not a victory of the hearts of the people. It's not even a, in, a complete military victory. It's not a victory in every sense of the word. It's maybe just a victory against the army, but not a victory against the people. It's not, op it's not you know, in every sense of the word, you understand? So it's very difficult to say in wars that a victory is absolutely clear. You get me? In the Fath of Makkah, Allah says, Inna fatahna laka fathan, not just fathan, Inna fatahna laka fathan, mubinan. It's going to be clear. The clearest victory in human history is the victory given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that victory wasn't even the result of war. It wasn't even the result of war. It was the result of strategy. It was the result of, of patience. It was more important than anything else, it was the result of discipline. It was the result of discipline. The Sahaba are the ultimate victory. Not because they go in the battlefield, because they obey the Messenger وسلم, unconditionally. When he tells them to put the ihram on, they put the ihram on. When he takes it off, they take it off. When they walk to Makkah, they walk to Makkah. When they have to walk back, they'll walk back. No complaints. No complaints. We want victory. Allah is telling us the prerequisites. We have to have discipline. We have to have control over our emotions. We cannot be mobs, angry mobs that can't think clearly. We have to be people that understand the definition of victory from Allah's book. We have to become these thoughtful people. You know? The ummah today, the last thing you find in us is discipline. It's so sad. The last thing you see in us is discipline. We don't even have discipline in the way we park our cars outside the masjid. By the way, when Salat begins, it's beautiful discipline. It's beautiful. We all, you know, you could be anywhere, our kids could be going crazy. When Qatqamata Salah, Qatqamata Salah, we all line up perfectly. Isn't that the case? Everybody checks their feet. Everybody lines up perfectly. And as soon as Salat is done, we go back to chaos again. The Salat five times a day, what does it teach us? <coughs> discipline. And actually it proves that Muslims are capable of amazing discipline. You cannot find any other religion that just a simple call is made. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Hiya ala salah, Hiya ala falah. And all the conversations will stop, all the cell phones will turn off, all the, everything will go, go dark, you know, everybody will stop playing, everybody will stop sitting down, everybody will stand up, perfectly line up like an army. 
Even though they don't know each other, they never trained together, they don't even know what general is who's leading the prayer, they don't know nothing, but they will line up immediately. That is impossible anywhere else other than this religion. We are a people of discipline. But unfortunately, outside of Salah, what we, what we learn in Salah needs to now come outside of Salah. We need to become disciplined people. These are some thoughts that I wanted to share with you, especially with the younger generation here, just to illustrate that there's a lot to think about in Allah's book. You know, there's a lot to reflect in this deen. A lot to understand, a lot to grasp. And if we begin to be, become people who tr deeply, truly understand the Book of Allah, then we will be in a better position to act on the Book of Allah. If you want to act on the Book of Allah, you first have to understand the Book of Allah. If you don't have a good understanding, you're not going to have a good action. <laughs> you're not going to have good, good implementation of Allah's Book. And this book is not like a magazine. It's not like a, an article or a blog. You can't just read it just like this and I, got, I get it, I get it. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Don't they reflect deeply on the Qur'an? Every ayah you have to think about it, you have to ponder over it, you have to study it, you have to dive in like you're diving into an ocean, and then you will get the wisdom that you can act on. You can't just casually browse through it. It's not a casual read. You can't skim through the Qur'an to get its treasure. You understand that? We unfortunately today, we have a very shallow appreciation of the Qur'an. We have to change that in our culture. We have to become a culture of people that celebrate tadabbur in the Qur'an, tafakkur in the Qur'an, ta'allum of the Qur'an, studying tafsir of the Qur'an in depth, studying its language in depth, understanding it and pondering over it and discussing it in depth so that we can all act on it in the way that we're supposed to act on it. That is my dua for this ummah. That, that may Allah Azza wa really make us a people that are connected with His book the way we're supposed to be connected. That understand it in the most pure, the most refined way, in the way it was supposed to be understood. May Allah Azza wa make us a people of the Qur'an that don't take it, you know, don't become lax in regards to it. The month of the Qur'an is still fresh in our hearts. We just came out of Ramadan. But don't let it dry up so easily. Study Allah's book, guys. Study Allah's book. You spend your nights discussing world politics and nothing has changed. How about you spend your nights memorizing a surah or two? How about you spend your nights studying the book of Allah a little bit more? If the world won't change, at least you will change. At least you will change. And wallahi, when you change, then the world changes. Until you don't change, the world will not change. Allah, the world will not change. The Sahaba were the ultimate change. They brought an amazing transformation within themselves by Allah's book. And because of the change inside of themselves, Allah gave victory in their hands. The victory of conquer, conquest was nothing. That was just nothing. You know? That was uh, insignificant. This dunya was created for us. It's been made for us. We just have to become, we have to prove to Allah that we are just for Him. When we prove to Allah that we are for Him, then He will hand dunya over. It's not, no big deal to Him. There's nothing to Him, subhanAllah.